your time to attend this talk. I really appreciate it. And as I was just introduced, uh, I'm a chemist by training. I'm a fifth year PhD student in chemistry. But my work, which is directly connected with flu, requires an intersection of chemistry and biology. So I'll be, talk I'll be taking you through uh, flu virus in this talk on a very deep, on a very small scale level, as opposed to a uh, healthcare professional who would probably give you a more broader, more wider overlook. So we'll dive deeply into details and dissect how all of this works, how do our cells work, and how does flu virus work. So to give you a very brief outline of what to expect from today's talk, there will be three parts, as well just mentioned. And at first, we will have a very brief overview of what is flu virus, how does it work, how does it work inside our cells, and after that, in part two, we're going to address the topic that's in the title of this talk, which is mutants. What are mutants? Why do they happen? How they happen? And what does it mean for us as humans to get sick of food? And after that, we'll have a short break after part two. And then in the final part, in part three, we're going to talk how does all of the science that we will cover in the previous two parts on a very small level, how does it relate back to us, back to humans that get sick with flu? what happens if flu gets really bad, and how can we use science to prevent that. So let's start with part one, and we're going to take flu virus and dissect it into individual small building blocks and see how everything works. And first, let's define why we should care about flu at all, which might be not too obvious if you think about it right away. After that, we're going to talk about how our cells work, because we need to understand it before we introduce the main villain to the story. And after that, we'll end up with um, discussing how the flu virus works inside our cells. So let's first figure out why we should even care and study flu in this great level of details. So if you could please raise your hands if you have ever experienced any of the symptoms and ask yourself, do I have a flu? Okay, I see a lot of hands, so it means that flu is something that we at least thought about for at least a few times in our lives. But flu is a lot more than just these symptoms, and uh, when flu goes really bad, it can make you feel not only sick, but also can make you feel dead. And we're going to cover in part three how exactly flu can uh, cause death and cause a lot of complications. Uh, second, flu is something that spreads really easily, and um, it is enough for a sick person to just sneeze on you or to touch their face and then just give you a handshake to spread the virus. And um, just to have you, just to give you a scale of how easily it spreads, let's look at the previous season of flu, specifically in the U.S. And I have a few numbers here, just um, for a very brief overview. Um, about 300 million population in the U.S. and 50 million people got sick with flu. So when we're discussing flu causing people sick, it is always on millions of people, affecting people worldwide. And it is not only making people sick. A lot of people, as you can see here, almost a million people get hospitalized every year. And you also see the number of deaths, which again, we'll come back to part how flu can cause deaths in part three. So then if you combine these two um, complications together, you can get something that will cause pandemic, which is an outbreak of disease on a very large scale, on a worldwide scale. And in part three, we're going to have consider an example of 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which was very deadly, which was very nervous, and spoiler alert, it even killed more people than First World War. And finally, dry flu is hard to tackle with, and why it keeps coming back, is because it's a moving target. It always keeps changing, and we're going to discuss how exactly it changes in part two. So I hope I convinced you at least a little bit that flu is something that we should not take that easily. And now let's um, very briefly overview how do our cells work so that we could use this knowledge and understand how does flu virus work. So to explain some of the several battles that I'm about to throw at you, I will be using an analogy with a hypothetical town just to make it easier and to make the science look not so scary. And I will have, in general, I will have an analogy with my hypothetical town on the right, and then I will have some biology schematics um, on the left. 
So let's first go through an analogy and let's imagine a town, just a very hypothetical town, which is, has some borders, for example, it has some kind of town wall, and it also has a town hall building, which will be really important and we'll figure out why in just a moment. And let's assume that this town can sustain itself, it can produce everything it needs, and maybe even exchange some goods with other towns nearby. And let's focus on one of the goods that town is producing, for example, a tractor, something that's pretty complicated to make. Uh, it is essential for the town. For example, we can set a tractor well in the fields and it will give us uh, food for the town to feed its citizens. And let's think of how the town would make one specific product, such as tractor. Uh, we probably need some kind of factory or power plant that will be producing this tractor. And let's think of factory as something very smart that, will, that has um, supplies shipped directly to it. And it has very qualified professionals that would assemble your final product depending on instructions that you give to this factory. So we need an instructions to feed to this factory if we want to build something like a tractor, for example. And when I'm saying about instructions, we need some blueprints. And let's say that we store these blueprints in the town hall. And they cannot leave the town hall. We only have one copy of the blueprints per town. So if something happens to these blueprints, for example, if you spill coffee on them, or if your cat eats part of this unique blueprint, or um, you're being a little bit sloppy and you tear a part of it, then your town will be in a pretty big trouble because there's no lack of coffee. So we cannot really feed um, these unique blueprints directly to our factory. And what the town does instead, it makes copies. Let's say that the town hall has a copy machine, and you can easily walk into this building, make, take a copy of any blueprint that you need, and take out the copy. And since we're making a copy, let's make not just one, but let's make a lot of copies. In case if something happens to one of them, then we can easily replace it with a pack of copy. And then we can use those copies, instead of unique blueprints that are precious, to fit into our factory. And the factory will produce our tractor. So now let's go through a somewhat similar process but that happens inside our cells. And let's think of cell as a, as a town, which, in which town hall will be called nucleus. And the tractor that our town is producing will be some kind of protein that cell wants to make. Now, if I say protein, we might think of these two, pro these two sources of protein. And it will be correct, they are composed out of a lot of protein. But what I'll be talking about, since I'm a chemist and I look at much smaller scale, I look at small building blocks, individual blocks that compose these uh, breakfast and dinner proteins, respectively. And I'll be talking about molecules. And you could see the definition of molecule on your index. So we have a cell in our analogy a town, which wants to produce some kind of product, protein, or tractor in our analogy. And and then first thing that we need, we need some kind of factory that's going to produce this protein. And in cells, those factories are called ribosomes. Very precise um, factories that will produce your product, your protein, based on instructions that you give to these factories. So if we want to produce a protein on a ribosome, then we need some kind of blueprint. And in cells, this blueprint is called DNA. And just like our blueprint that's unique and is stored in the town hall, DNA is stored in the nucleus. And it's also unique, it's also precious, and you don't want anything bad to happen to this unique molecule. So we need to make copies instead. What we call in the cell, it makes RNA molecules, which are copies of the specific region in DNA that has instructions that you need to make some specific uh, protein. So you have to go to town hall or to nucleus to get your blueprint DNA, and then you make RNA copies that you can, after that, feed to the factory, and then the factory will read these instructions, and based on what they say exactly, it will produce protein, or in our analogy, it will be a fact detractor. So what I just described has a name. It's called Central Dogma of Molecular Biology, and it sounds like this DNA makes RNA makes protein. Now, there's a lot more to add to every part of this statement, but we don't need to know this for the purpose of this talk. And now let's 
how do I introduce the flu virus? Let's introduce the villain to the story. And so what is flu? Flu is a virus, which means that it is a parasitic particle. It's very small, and it is very complex if you compare it to us humans. And the fact that it is a parasite means that it needs to live in someone. It cannot survive by its own. And if it wants to proliferate, it has to infect hosts, for example, humans and animals, that it can infect and make them sick. And when, it's, when it gets inside, for example, us humans, it can make a lot of copies of itself. And then these copies can repeat this process all over. And uh, this particle, is, as I mentioned, is pretty simple. It has instructions for RNA molecules that are wrapped in some kind of protective code or protein code to keep it safe. So let's review how our town works. We have unique DNA blueprints. Then we make a copy of them, which is called RNA. Then these instructions, these RNA instructions, go into ribosome factories. And then these factories can produce a protein of interest or a tractor analogy. So let's introduce our villain and let's, in our analogy, let's think of it as a criminal that's traveling on a bike. And it will be clear why I chose a bike in a little while. So I have this criminal that wants to get inside in town and make nasty business. And what's special about this criminal is that it already has uh, photocopies of instructions that it needs to fit into that tree. It does not carry any blueprints. It already has the copies. So it does not need to go in the town hall, make copies, go back, and reach um, the factory. It can feed this file copies right away. And then the factory, because it does what the, pro what the instructions tell it to do, it will start producing whatever instructions have it. For example, it can start producing bike wheels. It will also mean that if it is um, shifting its focus on producing bike wheels, it's going to produce less tractors which might be creating that for the cell or for our town. And then as the as we keep getting more and more sick, uh, our factories produce more and more parts of the bike and eventually uh, it will make you even more sick. So now let's revisit what's happening in the cell in the same protest. We have a flu virus which is a little bit in the story. And since all we know is carrying copies of its instructions, it only carries its RNA molecules, that it feeds directly to ribosome factories, and then ribosomes can produce proteins. So I will be calling RNA or instructions that virus has, it, calling it viral RNA to distinguish it from RNA or instructions of our cells, and viral RNA will be making viral proteins. And you don't need a lot to start this process. You need very little virus. For example, when someone who has flu is sneezing on you, that's not a lot of virus that you get that certainly breathes in that air. But then once it gets inside us, it makes a lot of copies of itself. And then eventually, the resources of this town or ourselves, they will be uh, pretty much destroyed by this criminal, by this virus that's making more copies of itself. And then these copies can go and spread out into towns or cells nearby, and then it will um, spread the infections throughout our body. So let's review what we just learned in this session. We learned how our own cells make proteins. They start with DNA blueprints, which they make copies of called RNA molecules. And then they feed them to ribosome factories that make some kind of cellular protein or product that we'll need for our town to function. And then we also reviewed how the flu virus works. We learned that it does not have blueprints. It already carries RNA copies that it fits directly to our factories using our own resources to produce its own viral proteins and making more copies of itself. So in the next part, we're going to use this knowledge and understand how exactly um, it is called. Is it making us sick? What our bodies do to prevent us from being sick, and what the mutants are and where they come from. But before we get into that, I will welcome any questions that you might have at this point. Yes, please. Uh, some viruses enter the body, and <clears throat> even if they are limited in some way, not a cure, but a, some limitation. They still never die. 
Okay, so the question was, uh, if the viruses enter the body, but then they don't cause infection or sickness, what happens to them, and do they never die? Um, so I will be touching upon it in the next part, but our body has a defense system that um, is pretty complex, and it monitors, um, monitors our body and monitors invaders. So there, is, there are different, um, different responding elements of our defense system. Some of them can detect invaders right away, and then they can just destroy them before they enter the cells. Um, some of them act a little bit later, and if your cells do get virus inside of them, then uh, a certain part of your immune system will detect that and destroy those. So there are different levels of defense that our bodies have, and um, I would say normally, um, pathogen or germ should not just stay and sit in your body, although it is definitely possible, especially if, if the germ knows how to hide, and some of them do. Okay, I was thinking specifically of HIV, for example, yes. and herpes, yes, which, uh, are, which yeah. I've read can be subdued, but never completely destroyed. Yeah, so the extension of the question was about herpes and HIV, which can still uh, sit in our bodies, but not really destroy. Um, I do not know much about herpes, but I do know a little bit about HIV. And HIV works a little bit differently from flu. It does have a lot of common features, but uh, the way HIV hides, um, HIV infects our immune cells, or our defense cells that are supposed to be uh, recognizing it and uh, basically killing it. Uh, but it can hide, it can stay inside, um, which would call latent or dormant infection. So they won't be recognized if there is no virus produced. And yes, it is still a big problem, and there is no cure, at least as far as I know. Any more questions? Well, um, if there are no more questions, then let's move on to part two and actually see how does all of this that I just told you in part one, how does it all actually relate to the topic of this talk, which is about mutism. So let's see what the structure of this part will be like. First, I will very briefly talk about how our bodies can defend itself uh, from flu. After that, we address the main part of this talk, which is about moons. What are they, where they come from, and why should we be concerned? And finally, I will briefly mention how our defense is catching up and not letting us get even worse. So first, let's review our defense methods uh, very briefly. So if I have a town, we can think of a lot of different ways of how to protect it. And in our bodies, it will be called immune system, which is pretty complex and it has a lot of different layers. But I'll be focusing only on one part for this talk, and uh, the part that I'll be talking about will be about antibodies. And in my uh, analogy, I'll be imagining imagine them as police officers that protect our town. So let's first review. Based on our analogy, how do these uh, police officers or antibodies, how do they arrest food and not get, us, get sick? So let's say that we have a police officer that is uh, trying to protect our town from criminals that are about to invade it and sabotage our factories. Uh, and the way a police officer operates in our town, he has um, pictures of the criminals that he knows for sure that they are criminals, and as soon as he sees them, he has to arrest them. And let's imagine that there is a suspicious personality approaching our town on a bike that looks like uh, this person on the poster. And if there is an exact match, if police officer is sure that it is exactly the same person that's in front of him and that's on this poster, then it's going to arrest this criminal and not let it you know, spread the crime in our town and not even enter the town. So as I just mentioned before, police officers of our bodies are, are called antibodies. And to be honest, antibody is also a protein. And antibody works somewhat similar like a police officer in our town. And when antibody is looking for a suspect, it has it also has a portrait of 
someone that he, it is after. And it's, it is specifically looking at something that's located on the outer shell of, the, of our flu virus, which is probably called amalutin, just so we know its name. And if we look at the surface of the virus here, um, there's a lot of these gray proteins that I'm showing here sticking out. In the, so it is the first thing that uh, you would see when the virus is approaching antibody. And to make it even more specific, it not only looks at this protein, but it also looks at the very surface. And it tries, when it tries to arrest flu, antibody is trying to physically attach to this protein on the surface. And this area here, which is uh, right where the antibody binds, it is the most accessible part of the flu virus. So you don't need to try too hard, you can bind to it right away. And if it is a perfect match, like with this poster and our suspect, then we would say uh, the virus was neutralized, which is equal to arresting the criminal, putting it in handcuffs, and putting a bike lock on the bike. So if everything was worked so great, then we would not have problems with uh, getting really sick with food, and especially we would not have mutants. So let's do that. Let's think that there is a second criminal that wants to evade from the arrest. How do you uh, escape? Well, we know that a police officer has a poster with a picture of how the suspect looks like. And let's say that we change something in the way the suspect looks. For example, uh, you can change wheels on this bike. You can make them smaller and drop a good different color tires. And in this case, it will not be a match. And of course, the police officer is not stupid. He knows that there's something going on here. It's not right. But there has to be an exact match between what's on the poster and what the police officer sees right in front of him. So in that case, you'll have to let this guy go because it does not look exactly like on the poster. So a similar thing happens with antibodies. Uh, we know that antibodies are after this one protein that's sticking out on the surface of virus particle. And this is where we get mutations. We can have small changes, just like the spindle on the bike changed the size and color of the tires on the bike. Uh, same small change can happen on the surface uh, protein of the, our virus particle. We can have small change so that the antibody cannot physically attach to this protein anymore. And this change doesn't have to be really dramatic. It has to be small enough just so that antibody cannot bind um, and attach to this uh, protein on the outside. And in that case, it will be, um, we'll have to let this criminal go and the virus will not be neutral. So, as I just mentioned, mutations are small changes. It does not have to be something dramatic. And if we look at our criminal's analogy, it can be as subtle as, for example, changing the color of your bike frame. And some, um, some mutations might be better. For example, in this case, if you just paint your bike in a different color, it will be really small change. It's not going to affect how the bike rolls or it's not going to change almost anything other than how it looks, but it will be enough to escape. And this is what the flu virus is also after. If we have some original virus and then uh, we look specifically at this protein on the outside, we can have um, mutations where the small changes happen in any part of it. But then some mutations might be better than others, which means that um, there will be really small change that almost that almost does, does almost nothing to you or to your, to the bike uh, of this criminal in our analogy, but it is enough to not be recognized. And I have to mention that mutations or changes they're not always good. And you have to be honest, mutations are usually very bad for proteins, which means that it makes it hard they make it harder for protein to do its job. And in you know, terms of our bike analogy, you can think of, for example, bike has a square wheels now. So how are you going to ride a bike with square wheels? Where you can have a perfectly fine bike, but it will be no handlebars. So how do you brake? How do you um, choose where you're going to bike, where you're going to move? Um, and in this case, limitations can be uh, also harmful. 
And let's see, let's look more closely how do mutations happen and where do they come from. So what do we need if we want to make a lot of virus particles or a lot of bytes, we just on just one bike. We need uh, a lot of instructions that we can feed to the factory, but also to give them to the new bytes that we're assembling. And we also need the actual bike itself, or something to carry and pass around these instructions. And same goes for virus. We need RNA instructions, and we need some protein as a cargo or some way to deliver it so it can make more copies of itself. So, as you might recall from the previous part, when viruses or our criminals when they make more, more copies of themselves, they start with some pre-made copies or RNA molecules that they bring with themselves. But then eventually they have to make more copies of these instructions to pass along to the next generation. And you have to make more copies, and then eventually you make a mistake. So in our analogy, let's say that our criminal is making these copies himself on themselves. Uh, because it is something very important and it cannot be trusted to anyone around. And let's say that this criminal is operating somewhere in a dark basement where there's almost no lighting, it's really hard to write and draw some complicated schematics, and maybe also this criminal has some problems with spelling. So eventually all of these copies that come out of this copying process, they will have mistakes. And uh, in terms of our virus, these mistakes or these mutations, they happen at the level of instructions or RNA molecules. And you should also might recall from the first part, what happens with these instructions afterwards? You feed them to the factory. And the factory is going to do what you tell it to do. So if you give it um, instruction with a mistake, then it will produce whatever instruction says. So for example, you can end up with a square wheel like you can see here. And this would mean, in terms of our virus, it will be it will mean mutated proteins or proteins with some kind of mistake when you compare it to what was before it, or original one. And then eventually, you're going to have mutant viruses which have both mutated mutant proteins surrounded by uh, mutant RNA. So. If the story ended here, it would be really bad for us because as soon as we have those mutations, our defense or our antibody police officers cannot really arrest those, and then the criminals or virus goes loose. But for, fortunately for us, this is not where the story ends, and our defense system always keeps up to date. So let's review very briefly how it happens. If we have a police officer that is operating based on some kind of poster where it has to know how exactly how the criminal looks like, we can train the police officer. We can give him um, posters with criminals that were spotted in other towns, for example. So then when they approach our town next time, he'll know what to look for. He'll be prepared. And same goes for antibody. We know that antibody is after the specific protein that sits on the very surface that's really easy to reach. So we can train this antibody and show a different or mutated proteins so that it would know what to recognize. And in fact, um, what our body is going to do is going to produce a lot more different antibodies. So we'll have a certain antibody or a certain police officer for a certain mutant virus or for a certain criminal. And after that, uh, if you have this um, change in our defense system, then they will know uh, as soon as these mutant uh, viruses enter our body, and they'll know what to recognize and they can neutralize it right away. So, as we would say, in this case, mutant viruses will be neutralized by antibodies, or our criminals will be arrested. Um, so, there are two possible ways how to keep our immune system up to date, or how to train the defense system of our bodies up to date, so that we don't get really sick of food. And the first way is to actually catch flu. Uh, this is going to create what we will call immune memory. So your defense system will spot these criminals in town, and it will know how it looks like, how they look like, and so that if you ever encounter them again, your body or your antibodies will know specifically what to look for. But then, this is not exactly the best way to get um, 
this update in her defense system. So that second way of how you could keep your uh, defense up to date is vaccines, which uh, you don't have to get sick, which is the good part. And what vaccines do, we could um, parallel them to train our police officers. For example, instead of giving them just one or two uh, pictures of suspects that were supported previously, we could give our police officers an entire database, an entire photo book of um, criminals that were spotted previously or that might be spotted in town so that they will be better prepared and they will know exactly what to look for um, without getting our town invaded by criminals or without us getting flu. So let's recap what we just uh, learned in this section. We learned that flu virus changes and it requires small changes called mutations. And it does so by having mistakes it's in its RNA instructions molecules that then make it into um, protein molecules for the states also mutations. But then our defense system also does not just stay, stay in place. And our antibodies keeps up with these changes so that we can successfully fight with the invading viruses. And let's pause here for questions. After that, we'll have a short break. And in the last and third part of this lecture, we're going to learn how does all of these science go to all of these details actually relate to what's happening in our bodies when we get sick with flu, and what happens if everything goes really bad, which will be discussion about uh, 1918 pandemic, and then what can we do to make it not happen again, or at least how to move towards better treatment and better prevention. But for now, I welcome any questions that you might have. Oh, that's a lot of questions. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, my understanding is that the blue virus will go through a cell wall um, and eat it, and I guess it goes through the, the small pores. So when you have the uh, attached uh, antibodies, it basically is too large to fit. Uh, is that my correct like, conclusion? Mm -hmm. So the question was, um, when the flu virus enters our cells, usually, but then if we have antibody attachment to it, it becomes too big and it cannot enter the cells. So yes, this is almost almost completely correct, but it's not only the size matters. Uh, the way antibodies bind, yeah, it, it does. It definitely does make this overall architecture much bigger. But also, it binds this surface protein called hemoglobin that I show in gray on the sides. And this protein, it has a very important job, and it is the protein that helps the virus get inside. It's like a lockpick to our town. So, for example, to our town gates, they have a lock on it. So, if you lock this lock, then you cannot enter the cell, and you cannot unpack everything that's inside into your cell and make more copies of it. So, yes, that was almost exactly correct. Yes, please? Uh, you mentioned that there are two ways to um, train your body's defenses against the flu virus. How does that account for? Okay, so the question was about um, two ways of training the defense system, and what does it have to do with people who don't get flu at all? Or sick. Or, or very sick. Um, so I would think that if you never got flu in your life, then you're very lucky and definitely keep doing what you're doing to not get flu. Um, next, uh, you can still get flu, but you can get actually mild symptoms and think of it as a common cold, for example, that will go away in a, like, relatively uh, fast. Um, so this would mean that your immunity is fighting it really well, that's my understanding. And I'm not a healthcare professional, so I can only speculate on this point. Um, but uh, usually, if we do encounter flu, and I'm pretty sure that we do encounter it at least once in a while, uh, then it all depends on what condition our defense system is in. If it is really well prepared, then you might not be able to feel anything, then you will have no symptoms and you won't even know that you have flu. Uh, but if, if it goes really bad, then it will be really obvious if you, that you do have flu and that you might be able to seek some medical help. So I guess to answer your question, sometimes flu can be asymptomatic. Um, but again, I don't think I can answer in more details just because I'm not a, I have nothing to do with the healthcare. Yes? Just as a follow on to that, how can you better prepare yourself for it? What, what changes could you make so that you are better prepared? Mm -hmm. 
So the question was, how could you better prepare yourself for food? Um, and so the best way to be prepared for flu is to not get it. So avoid the flu as much as you can, which it might sound very repetitive, and you've probably seen it. So the signs in every, uh, every corner, and especially bathrooms, wash your hands. Uh, because the way flu spreads, it really sp it spreads in water droplets. So if you if you get flu or if someone you know gets flu, and if you touch your face and then uh, shake hands, or even if you stand up to, I believe it's up to six feet next to an active person, you're still be at the risk. So if you know someone who's getting flu, convince them to take care of themselves. Um, then for yourself, boost your immunity. Vaccines is a good chance to prepare yourself, although we know that they're not always effective, but still it does train your immunity to recognize at least some of the flu viruses. And um, just take care of yourself and like, know your body and listen to your body, and especially if you feel that you're uh, vulnerable or getting tired, especially right now when the flu season starts, between you know, it starts around October and then typically ends around March, but it peaks in the winter. So just general precautions, watch hands a lot, um, try to train your immunity, and overall just try to avoid the flu as much as you can. Yes, please? So the question was, how exactly do viruses put more copies on the cells, and do they have a specific machinery for that? Um, so that's a very good in-depth question. And viruses do have a little bit of machinery, but specifically for flu virus, it's very minimalistic. It carries the bare minimum that it needs, and the only machinery that it's uh, bringing in for it is called polymerase, which makes more copies of RNA instruction molecules, and that is the one that's making mistakes. But then everything else, um, to make more proteins, it uses our ribosomes, it uses our resources. So the virus, because it has the very, very minimum of everything it needs, it uses a lot of our resources and it hijacks a lot of our systems uh, to produce more copies of itself and to make more, more of its proteins. Yes, With the uh, virus replicating, at some point there's going to be a, a large number of them. Do they cause the cell to explode or, or do they just leak out the cell wall? Or Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the question was when viruses are making a lot more copies of themselves, what happens to the cell? Does the cell explode or do they just leak out of the cell? Uh, and yes, eventually the cell is going to die because you're using a lot of resources to produce that something that the cell does not need. Um, so eventually the cell is going to die, but while the cell is still alive, uh, it is making more viruses and they are biting off, they're exiting the cell. Um, as far as I know, it does not um, cause the cell to explode, which some viruses do, but I believe that flu doesn't and you can just get it can keep producing more viruses and they'll keep exiting the cell. As soon as the cell is uh, completely dead, it cannot produce anymore. So then does it infect surrounding cells or does it get into capillaries? And which tissues would be more uh, prone for being infected by a flu virus? Are, are, are some tissues more prone for infection? Uh, so just to clarify, you're asking what cells might be more prone to flu virus infection, or is there any requirement? Um, so, flu usually affects our respiratory tract, which uh, will get our throat and our lungs, and this is primarily where it replicates. Um, so these are the cells where it primarily, that is primarily attacking, and once it gets inside one cell and starts making more copies of itself, then they can spread into cells that are nearby. It doesn't, they don't want to have to travel that much, because, uh, the cells will be around composing our lungs and uh, our airways. Thank you. Um, our questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so for the flu 
the virus? Is there one copy of the genome in, in one viral particle, or are there multiple copies? And from there, um, how do these mutations arise? Is that from just gene shuffling, or just because of the very error prone uh, clone rates? So, one more pretty much in the last question. Uh, first, does the full virus has uh, one instruction copy, one RNA copy, or a lot of them? And how do mutations arise? Does it happen by kind of shuffling or just uh, mistakes or mutations? Uh, so, first, if you look at just one um, particle of the virus, it's going to carry just one set of instructions. Um, the virus has uh, not just one protein, it uh, actually has a handful of proteins, so it's going to have uh, instruction that corresponds every part of this particle that it needs to make. Um, so in that case, there's one copy of everything that the virus needs. Uh, and the second question, how do mutations arise? So I briefly touched on just sitting in a basement and making copies with mistakes. Um, so there's one way of how we can make uh, small changes or I would say point mutations. Uh, then the second way, as you mentioned, uh, yes, you can shuffle them. And in our analogy, it will be if we get two criminals in one town, and for example, uh, those bikes collide on the narrow street, and they get all their instructions messed up and mixed together, and then uh, they're trying to pick them up really fast and uh, to escape before the police arrive. Uh, so in that case, you can shuffle um, uh, these instructions so that every virus will um, end up with a slightly different set of instructions. And yes, this is also possible. Uh, this is called genetic reassortment. And this is something that we are very afraid of because that can make new flu viruses and they, will cause, they can cause potentially massive outbreaks and epidemics. Yes, please? Uh, so like, does it stop working, or are there any other consequences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, uh, what happens when virus makes a mistake? Will it stop working, or what else can happen? And uh, you can have a lot of uh, all sort of things happen to a virus. Uh, some mistakes will be really bad, so that a uh, specific protein or specific spot where this mutation was, uh, it will prevent protein from doing its job, and then in, the, in that case, the virus will just die and not be able to make more copies of itself. So that will be a good scenario for us as humans. Uh, and, but other mutations, they can um, cause some small defects, but your protein will be still working, and some of these defects might make it work a little bit worse, um, make your job a little bit more slower or sloppier, but still it will be enough for the virus to live and move on. Um, other mutations might make it better, and um, it will be better for our virus and worse for us, which would be, for example, it can escape more antibody surveillance better than original virus. Um, and that would be the best time to for a virus possible and only the worst for us. How long does flu virus live outside the body? And to the best of my knowledge, if you have flu just virus just sitting on the surface, it will live up to 24 hours approximately on just a solid surface. But then um, usually when we transmit flu, it is transmitted in water droplets, and I believe it can live for longer in, in those water droplets. Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering, because you said that the flu virus has an increase and a decrease, and this is probably well known, but uh, one can imagine a scenario where the increase is so big that it would keep making mutations that the our immune system couldn't defend against, and it keep making new antibodies. Why is this a scenario that is possible to happen, or is it just so improbable that it won't? So the question was, what's going to happen if the flu keeps making more and more mistakes, and eventually our human system will not catch up with it? Um, so theoretically, it is sometimes possible if all of these mistakes are good for the virus. 
But usually in these states of mutations, um, if we don't want to look at the polarity of just proteins in general, usually these mistakes are not great and they come at some specific cost. And sometimes um, it can be so bad so that the proteins will not be able to you know, continue doing their job. And there might be a majority of those kind of mutations. There might be still good ones, uh, that those that allow it to escape better, but there will still be a lot of uh, those that are really bad for food proteins as well. Uh, so usually, um, at least if um, you know, previously healthy people get flu, their body will cope with infection um, and contain it. But then if it really goes, um, if there is a risk of it going uh, this crazy, then you definitely need to see a healthcare professional and take some additional precautions. Yes, please. Um, I have a question. Uh, why a vaccination works just only on 60 and 70 percent of work? Efficient in 60 percent. Yeah, so the question about, was about um, that vaccination efficiency and why this <coughs> works only some percent, but not completely effective. Um, so I believe it goes up to how vaccines work. Again, this. Uh, it is not really overlapping with my work in my PhD, but to the best of my knowledge, um, to make a vaccine every year, we need to gather some knowledge on previous viruses that were circulating before around the world, and then um, what happens uh, globally, like one uh, initiated by World Health Organization, have to gather all this information and try to predict what's going to happen and what flu we're going to have in the season. Because it always changes, so we don't know what flu is going to be you know, in a month, in two, or in a year from now. And we can only make the best guess. Uh, so sometimes this best educated guess uh, is close to what's happening. Sometimes it's really far. And I believe that's why uh, vaccine effectiveness relies a lot. Any more questions, Yes? Um, my physician said that the current flu vaccine uh, has four to five strains, the correct term, strains? Yeah. Um, and how are those actually, how are the antibodies actually collected and reproduced? Okay, so there are two questions here. First of all, the current vaccine, uh, how many strains are there? And second, how do you antibodies, uh, how antibodies produced and how do they uh, get circulated in our bodies. Uh, so first, I believe that in this season we have what's called a quadrivalent vaccine, which means it has four different strains of flu. Uh, so this is to address your first question. And second, uh, antibodies are produced by our immune cells. Um, they've been called B cells. and um, it is a process that takes um, quite some time. That's why they usually say that once you get a flu vaccine, it takes about well, two weeks to start producing those antibodies. Um, so it is a, not, it's not an immediate process, but it's all initiated by uh, cells of our immune system. And then the antibodies can just circulate in our bodies and uh, like surveillance and protect us from any invading pathogens. Questions before the break? Uh, well, if you do have any more questions, I'll be happy to take them during the break. But now, let's have a short, have a short five to ten minute break, and then we'll come back for the last part. And in this part, let's use all of the signs that we learned, learned in the first two parts to actually understand what it means for us as humans that can get sick with flu. And first, let's talk about what happens if flu goes really bad and how you can actually die from getting flu. And after that, let's look into our past more than 100 years ago, and let's look at 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And finally, let's end up on something really positive and see what is going on right now in the science and how we're trying to fight flu better and uh, how to come up with better strategies to defeat the virus. So first, let's talk about what happens when everything really goes bad. Um, Let's look at our defense system. 
and let's keep the Torah analogy just to keep it more simple. Uh, if we have just one criminal trying to get into our town, usually what we, what we saw in our analogy previously, we sent one police officer that would arrest this criminal on the bank. And that was something that was just right. But if you have too much, let's think of it as sending a tank division to arrest uh, and to capture this one person, one criminal on the bank. That sounds like a little bit too much. And what it means for us in our bodies, when we have something that I call here as mild flu or regular type of flu, uh, it will be equal to sending a police officer to arrest a criminal in our analogy. But then when we have too much when we send the state division to arrest one person on a single bike, um, then what we would call it severe inflammation. So inflammation is a response of your body to invading germs or pathogens like flu. And it is something that's meant to protect you, but if there is too much of it, it can uh, get out of control and start harming your body. Uh, and not only uh, you're going after flu virus, like 10 division here, but you could imagine the tanks would cause a lot of damage trying to capture um, one criminal that's sneaking around the town. And Again, what it means for our bodies, the severe inflammation, it can affect different organs such as heart, brain, or muscle, and eventually it can overwhelm these organs so much so that uh, these organs would fail. And yes, if you fail, if at least one of these organs fail, then you'll be in a pretty big trouble. Uh, so second part, uh, second way of how flu can kill people is called secondary infections, which is not only about flu. And in this case, we have something else invading, which I'll be calling co-infection, where there is something else, some other germ other than flu, invading our body. And at this point, when this happens, you're already fighting flu, you're already fighting it so hard so that your defense system is weakened by this fight. And which makes it really easy for this second germ, if you encounter it, enter your body and cause additional trouble. And to be more specific, pneumonia is one of very uh, widespread flu complications that is causing uh, a lot of deaths. And you have to stress out, uh, it can be fatal if it is not treated properly. Now, to not to scare you too much, um, it's not something that happens a lot, it's not something that happens frequently, and um, healthcare professionals define what's called high-risk groups, or people who are in more risk than other than others, um, and specifically people about 65 years old or really young kids might have uh, increased risks of getting these complications. But again, it's not something that happens frequently, but something to keep in mind uh, to avoid it. And to explain the secondary infection, let's get back to our town analogy, and let's say that there are, um, for example, four police officers. Uh, protecting our town, and if we just have flu, if we just have one criminal, we can send one of those officers to arrest this criminal, but then we'll still have three that are protecting the areas so that um, no more criminals can really sneak past them. But when we have something else invading, um, we're saying that we have quite a, a pretty bad flu going on, and we have, for example, four. Um, criminals and trying to invade our town, and we're using all of our resources, all of our police officers, to arrest those criminals. And what happens here, you can see that our town is left pretty much defenseless, so then if we have a second criminal trying to approach, it will be really easy for it to get inside, because there's almost no defense left, and basically leaving your town gates wide open. So it is really easy for the second germ to get inside uh, and cause trouble. So now, let's look at a specific example that's more than 100 years old now, but still very relevant and is still uh, scary, which is 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And the fact that is important to keep in mind is that this flu, this pandemic was so deadly, so it claimed more lives than World War I. And here are just some numbers um, for you, um, just for reference, uh, Spanish flu pandemic, as you can see, it was uh, it started at the very end of World War One, 
And if we look at casualties uh, from World War I, reported uh, deaths from both civilian population and military are about 40 million. Of course, estimates were right, but this was the most consensus um, number that I was able to find. And then if we compare that to Spanish flu pandemic, which killed between 50 and 100 million people, it is a lot more than the First World War, and to translate it into numbers, it was about 5% of the world's population. So one third of the world got sick with Spanish flu, and then uh, of those sick people, 10% died. It is a lot of people, and we're talking about millions and tens of millions of people. That's why it is uh, important to not let it happen again and to learn why it happened. Um, so there's something that makes Spanish flu different, and um, as I just mentioned, it was very deadly, and it affected literally the whole world. There was, at least to best of my knowledge, there was not a place that you, where you would be safe from flu, from Spanish flu, uh, except maybe very remote areas with, with very limited contacts for the outer world. Uh, so it affected the entire planet, and then it had a huge death toll. As I just mentioned, it killed about 3%, 3 to 5% of uh, estimates really by a lot of the world's population. And if you just compare it to seasonal flu, for example, from the last year, it was um, less than 1%. It is much less for what we usually culture from season to season. And Finally, there was something different about victims that died from the Spanish flu. I just mentioned in one of the previous slides that high-risk groups are usually very young kids or people older than 65 years old. But here, most of the people who died from Spanish flu were young people between 20 or 40 years old. Um, people who, as we would think, at least uh, right away, who should be really resistant and who should be able to fight with flu real well. So let's try to address the question that still a lot of researchers ask, what made this flu so deadly? And as I mentioned, first reason that um, can cause deaths uh, when you're sick with flu is severe inflammation. And that is what we believe happened in 1918. Um, researchers believe that there were a lot of cases when people just had their lungs failing. Uh, because of such severe inflammation, because of such um, severe and drastic response that our bodies uh, were producing, trying to fight with it. And again, in our analogy, it's like sending an army of life, an army of tanks against one single leg. Uh, second way uh, to die from flu is to get a secondary infection, which pneumonia was one of the lead, was again one of the leading killers um, during Spanish flu, and. Going back to our analogy, most of our defenses were uh, already very overwhelmed by this uh, highly de very deadly flu. And then we have the second germ who can just sneak into the town unnoticed and will not have any, um, anything to stop it. And finally, it is important to keep in mind that it all happened during World War I, even though it was the end of the war, it was still a very global and deadly war. And at that time, People didn't even know what flu was. They, uh, of course, there were no antivirals, there were no vaccines, and there were no there were even no antibiotics that would use to treat pneumonia. So the only thing they could do, they could just isolate people as much as they could, um, and just hope that they would recover. And since it was all happening during World War One, um, which was very deadly, as you might remember from the previous slide, 40 million casualties. It means that hospitals were overcrowded uh, with wounded soldiers and wounded civilian population. And that, those were the perfect conditions for the virus to spread because it spread so easily. Uh, and overall, at least these three major reasons made this virus so deadly. And we need to study to know first what happened and second to not let this happen again. And the interesting question to address is, how do we even study this uh, mass killer virus almost 100 years, even more than 100 years since this pandemic was raging? And the answer to this question lies, uh, lies in a town called Red Bishop in Alaska. And in 1918, the population of this uh, town or village at that time was 80 adults, as it was officially registered. 
And in 1918, uh, when the Spanish flu struck, uh, 72 of those 80 people, so almost the entire village, died within five days. And those people were um, buried in a mass grave. And later on, um, Grandma Frost preserved all the bodies and all the virus that was still left with those bodies. And um, a lot of years later, uh, after the Spanish flu pandemic, there were multiple attempts uh, trying to recover flu virus from that uh, mass grave that was preserved in the permafrost. And it did take quite a lot of effort and it was a um, very impressive teamwork to recover the virus. And then in 1999, uh, researchers finally isolated uh, those RNA structures so we can um, uh, know what know exactly what, what those instructions were, and we can even recreate this virus uh, to study it. And it was recreated in 2005 in a very uh, strong and very safe environment in Center for Disease Control um, and Prevention. And we can use all of this information to study uh, where in depth, why was it so uh, lethal, why was it so virulent, why did it cause so many deaths and so rapidly in just five days and uh, what can it tell us um, about the future? Right? How can we use this information and um, use it to not let it happen again? Um, so we did learn quite a lot from this 1918 flu, and there's still a lot to learn. And uh, researchers did get some insights into um, what made this virus so severe. <coughs> they had some guesses before they started. Some guesses proved to be wrong. So even more than 100 years later, this mass killer can still surprise us. And we can also look at that virus in 1918 and compare it to what we have now, so then we will see exactly what changed, what direction was it changing, and where can it go next. And then there's still a great debate. Um, people are trying to figure out where did this virus come from. And there is one idea that's um, we actually discussed maybe this virus came from birds, and this is the reason why we got uh, so afraid for the bird flu um, about 10 years ago. Uh, we believe that if uh, flu from birds gets transmitted to humans, that can cause um, pandemics. So this is something that we're really afraid of, and something that we need to understand much better so that we know what to do about it. And. So finally, just to end, uh, what can we do about it? Like we have a lot of research that was done and still going on. So how do we use all of this to actually help us fight for this virus, for this enemy better? And I'll have it, uh, two possible ways. We can try making better vaccines or that would protect us better. And there is an idea of universal flu vaccine. What if you could get, uh, not just one flu shot for every season, but what if it was enough to get just one shot in, for example, 10 years that would protect you from a lot of different viruses and be effective for seasonal flu and even protect you from pandemic flu? This is something that people are currently trying to work on and not something that we have ready, but uh, something that we're actively looking into. And in that to our analogy, how is all of this supposed to work? If we compare it to seasonal vaccine, it will be able to you and our police officers just a few trouble three or four posters of criminals that are most likely to invade our town. But for a universal vaccine, at least to begin with, we can provide a lot more of these posters with all possible uh, criminals of all sorts of shapes that we could think um, would be invading in the next, for example, 10 years. And to translate it back into flu, um, we will be talking about specifically this protein that sits on the very surface of the virus shell called hemoglobin. And if we just have a few versions of, uh, three or four versions of this protein in our seasonal vaccine, then why not make a lot of different versions that we still believe are likely, we're likely to encounter, but we'll have a lot more diversity, so we'll be prepared for more viruses than just for seasonal vaccine. And yeah, this is some concept that we could just start with and then keep um, improving it. And 
One more uh, specific feature about this protein, we know that antibodies, they target the very top of this uh, protein molecule. We know exactly where they target. So um, what if instead of targeting this, um, this part of this region that can change a lot, that can mutate a lot, what if we, change, what if we target something that does not change so rapidly? Uh, we could target another region where that does not um, change as much because changes in that region would be a lot worse for the protein, so it will uh, do its job a lot worse if you get some change in that region, uh, which means that it will not change as fast as this region where antibody binds. Uh, and in that case, we could uh, this vaccine could protect us from um, Large, uh, even more, uh, even more different viruses and more different strains than our seasonal vaccine would. But and uh, this is the topic that is still currently actually being researched and there are some trials, but we don't have it yet. And, and but it is some one of the direction that we really want to move forward, um, thinking of how to protect ourselves better and more efficiently um, than using the tools that we have now. Uh, and finally, um, one direction that I'm partially working on is to find some new spots that we can strike at. We already know that where flu changes a lot, which parts of the virus change a lot, so why not to try to seek alternative targets? Why, can, why not to target something that does not change as rapidly, as readily, or um, at least as fast as, the, as, the, as what we target right now? And uh, to get it back and tie it to our analogy, let's think of our factory and let's, for example, educate uh, workers of our factory to recognize only instructions that human cell gives it. So it will still work fine for our instructions, but if we have instructions that come from virus, let's teach it to not follow those instructions or not to assemble um, the final product that the virus needs. Um, and this is one of the directions that is being actively researched right now. Um, we don't have the final solution yet, but there's a lot of efforts going on in both of these directions. So just to recap what we we're discussing today, and specifically this part, um, flu is not something that we should take easily. It can cause complications and even death. And we do have some uh, previous cases in history that um, should I show this and that can learn a lot about from them. And there's also a lot of research going on trying to understand how this changes and uh, how to use all of this data that we have right now to predict what's going to happen, how it's going to change in the next upcoming seasons or years, and how to better uh, prepare for this, how to treat it better or how to even better, how to prevent it. And with that, I welcome any questions that you might have to this part or to any of those. Yes, please. Um, so I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is about how you said you're thinking, you're thinking about targeting the stem of the virus. Um, wouldn't that kind of force and force the virus to evolve into something that we haven't seen before? And could that possibly create almost like a super virus that we don't know how to stop? Yeah, so the first question was um, if we're targeting the stem of this protein, or the stem of living protein, would it cause virus to mutate into something even worse, like a super virus? And, um, we haven't seen before. Yeah, something that we did not see before. Um, this is why we need extensive research in this area first. And yes, it might change from the previous data that we have right now. We believe that if the virus does change in this new region that we would like to target, it is usually very um, not tolerated by the virus. So it is usually uh, really bad consequences for the virus as a whole if you got changes in there. Um, potentially, there might be something that might arise to compensate for it. Um, if you have some really bad change in one spot of this protein, you can come up with something that's going to fix or at least um, mitigate the consequences of this. But this is why we still need a lot of research in this area. And this is not something that's ready 
uh, to go into the and then to go to, into the public. This is something that we're still trying to research on and trying to investigate what happens in all different scenarios. So the question was, um, uh, so the first part was that um, sometimes when you get a vaccine, you can feel bad for a week or two. And if this happens after a uh, seasonal vaccine, it has only three or four strains. What happens if we have a lot more strains, for example, in the universal vaccine? Will it just overload the organism? And um, yes, I understand your concern, but first, uh, they don't give you a life virus with the vaccine. They give you the dead virus that cannot give you flu, and usually, if you feel bad, at least what I um, what I know about, it should last not for a week or two, but usually for a day or two. And this is your immune system actually being trained. This is how you also know that the vaccine works um, because you start training your cells to make the antibodies or police officers, but it is not giving you flu, and. Um, it, it does take time to train it, so it's, they say usually about two weeks it takes to produce all of these antibodies. So you might get like you might get flu, for example, if you just got your shot and then you walk outside of clinic and then you meet a person and who has flu and puts needles on you, then you will get flu because your vaccine is still it is um, it did not finish its work yet; it just started because it takes two weeks to process, so in that case you can get real flu, but it's not going to be related to vaccine. And um, yes, regarding concern with just overloading the immune system with universal vaccine, this is one of the concerns, definitely. Um, that's why there's a lot of work that needs to be done with formulation and the dosing of how much do you need to, how much of this vaccine uh, or how much of individual uh, virus do you need to include uh, when you are preparing this vaccine. Um, this is something that has to be extensively researched. And uh, I, might be, I will be really speculating here, but I believe that you don't need that much. And if you have a little bit, very few cells that are um, targeted on a specific virus, if you do get infected with this specific flu, then your body will know that it needs to make more of these cells so they can produce more antibodies. So as long as you have even a little bit of memory that can be triggered, and then you can make more of those cells and you know, increase the response, that might be enough. Um, there's a lot more difficulties and a lot more questions that we need to answer for this universal vaccine. There's still a lot of uh, gaps in our knowledge that we need to know before it can even be tested. Um, and we're not quite there yet to make a universal vaccine, but it is something that we would really like to eventually come up with, or at least improve our seasonal vaccines this way. Uh, more questions? Yes, please. I was just wondering, because we keep producing more vaccines and making our bodies create more antibodies, or the memory of more antibodies, is there any research done on the upper limit, or if there is an upper limit, of how much memory of antibodies our body can actually have? Mm -hmm. The question was, uh, is there a limit of how much antibody memory our bodies can have, and because we keep producing more and more vaccines and training our immunity against new viruses, and uh, I believe there should be a limit. It's not something that I really know about, but also that that memory, uh, it's not going to, it might not last forever, so then uh, you will need to refresh it every year or two. And at least to my very, very brief understanding, uh, it's not something that will last forever. So then even if you had memory to something, you might not have it, say, 10 years after. Uh, but I will be really speculating here. Yes, please. Um, when you do have those antibodies uh, and you aren't really sick, 
sick, what does the antibodies do? The question was, uh, what do antibodies do if you're not being sick? Um, and it's, not some, it's something really outside of my expertise area, but I believe that antibodies are just, uh, um, they're just sur like surveillance in your, in your body uh, once they are produced, but then uh, a little bit there, if they're no longer needed, a little bit there should be a mechanism to just um, not produce more. And then uh, if you're not encountering any invader, then uh, antibodies are not going to be produced. There's a specific type of cells that just produce antibodies. So then if there's no need, I believe that those cells are not going to be producing more because it's going to be wasteful of your body resources. But then as soon as you do have an invader, then those cells, they will get uh, triggered and they will know that they need to produce more antibodies and that's when they get, will get activated. But if you're not encountering any flu, for example, for a while, then they will just stay dormant um, and they will um, just exist silently and not waste the resources or make more antibodies. Yes? Um, why are there seasons to the virus? Because the Spanish flu had it because of the season, like the summer, right? So why are there seasons? To yeah, the question was why are there seasons to the flu? And, um, why is the season starts really in October and then goes through winter and ends in around March. Um, so flu, there were a lot of the studies that show that flu survives better in a cold, dry weather rather than in warm and humid. That's why um, we get flu spreading better in the cold weather. Uh, first, because virus uh, lives in these conditions better and it can be transmitted easier. Also. If you just look at cold weather, um, people usually tend to gather and somewhere inside where it's warm and a lot of, uh, where there's a lot of people in a closed room, for example, like, like right now, which makes it much easier to spread the virus. Uh, if you have a lot of people in a confined space, and um, from what I read, it can spread up to six feet away. Uh, so it is again making better conditions for the flu to spread. And um, um, yeah, I believe there's are two main factors, and then uh, so this happens in the northern hemisphere, and then you can um, think of the southern part of the globe, the southern hemisphere. It will happen in the opposite. So when we have summer here, it will be winter there. That's why actually when they start producing. Or when they're trying to decide what vaccines to include into, what viruses to include into seasonal vaccine, um, World Health Organization initiates this meeting twice. So I believe it is February for Northern Hemisphere and September for Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so you have to account for the climate. Any more questions? With the Spanish flu slide, um, World War One ended in uh, 1918, and then the, the Spanish flu started in that same year. Um, is that just an interesting overlap, or do you think there's any relation, maybe to like the chemical warfare, weakening immune systems, or something, or if they're at all connected? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, if there's a connection, if there could be a connection. Um, between the end of World War I and uh, beginning of the Spanish flu, was it a coincidence or um, did, uh, did it have to do something with the end of the war? And um, I cannot be certain, I cannot draw any solid conclusions, but I believe, yes, you did mention the chemical warfare and overall after, after the war. Um, all of the soldiers and civilian population they were so weakened and their immune system was really weakened by the war. So it made them really susceptible, uh, susceptible to this flu virus. Uh, and it made it, it made the infection worse and it made it spread even easier. Um, we're, but because we're still not certain where this flu came from, we cannot really trace if it if it could have started somewhere earlier during the World War One, but I believe that World War One definitely made it worse, and we definitely 
uh, created a much better environment, much easier environment for the virus to move around and affect a lot of people. Any more questions that I did not address? Okay, um, that is the end of our lecture, and I would like to thank you all for coming and organizers for organizing this event. And if you do come up with more questions, I'll be around for a little while. And yeah, thank you very much for coming and stay safe and avoid the flu. But at least now you know how it works.